night. Good night. They say we're young and we don't know. Won't find out till we grow. Well, I don't know if all that's true. Cause you got me. Okay, campers, rise and sign, and don't forget your booties because it's cold out there today. It's cold out there every day. What is this, Miami Beach? Not hardly. And you can expect hazardous travel later today with that, you know, blizzard thing. That blizzard thing? Oh, here's the report. The National Weather Service is calling for a big blizzard thing. Yes, they are, but there's another reason today is very special. Especially cold. Especially cold, okay. But the big question on everybody's lips, chap lips, yeah, they're chap lips, right. Do you think Phil's going to come out and see his shadow? Punks at Tawny Phil. That's right, rodent lovers. It's Groundhog Day. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. The Rock Bellville Show. The Voice. Of the Marijuana Nation. Now, here's your host, Radical Ross Melville. Good day, tokers and tokets and non-token lovers of liberty. It is Monday, February 2nd, 2015, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. It also has to be the day after one of my favorite Super Bowls ever. And for all you fans of the Seattle Seahawks, I have only one thing to say. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. The Seattle Seahawks on the verge of becoming two-time Super Bowl champions completely choked on the half-yard line by making the worst call in a Super Bowl ever. Gee, you gave up a two-digit, double-digit lead in the fourth quarter of a championship game you thought you had in the bag and lost at the last second without your best player touching the ball. Gee whiz, what does that feel like, uh, Seahawks fans? <laughs> my goodness, I'm so happy. All I had asked for for my birthday was a humiliating defeat. I, that's all I wanted. I wanted someone to have a humiliating defeat worse than the humiliating defeat that the Green Bay Packers suffered in the NFC Championship. And boy, did I ever get it. I am just jubilant here at Rolla J Studios. Let's get to the show, though. On today's show, of course, it's our Monday show, and that means we speak with Dr. Mitch Earlywine in our Cannabis Q&A. That's coming up at half past, and we'll answer your live questions at 971-533-7111. We got a question about dabbing. Is it vaporization? We're also going to ask whether or not edibles affect your stomach lining at all, and a new study on marijuana and carcinogens, and another study on marijuana and the user's brain. So plenty of science to cover today in our cannabis Q&A. Then at the end of the show, we'll have time for a radical rant. And in the rant today, oh my God, folks, another tragic story to have to tell you. And it leads me to ask or actually to demand that we stop deputizing citizens to fight and die in the drug war. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible story to have to bring to you today about a 20-year-old's death serving as a confidential informant in North Dakota, I believe it was. Also on the show today, we will have time for some drug war data mining. I'm asking the question, why does Oregon's Governor John Kitzhaber think he knows more about marijuana legalization than the 56% of Oregon voters who passed Measure 91? Governor Kitz has all sorts of suggestions for the medical marijuana implementation that go completely completely against the will of the voters, more of whom voted for marijuana than voted for him. Also on the show today, GOP frontrunner Jeb Bush is a pot-smoking hypocrite, according to Senator Rand Paul, and we'll have time to do our 420 radio news. That's coming up right after this first break. No Toker Talk Radio today. I'm on the road to Salem to listen to legislators hear about marijuana implementation down in our state's capital. We'll tell you all about that on tomorrow's show. Stay tuned right after the break. The news is next. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. 
420 Radio is 24-hour marijuana legalization radio. Sir, do you think there will or should come a time for us to discuss the possibility of legalization, regulation, and control of all drugs, thereby doing away with the violent criminal market as well as a major source of funding for international terrorism? Thank you so much for your time, Mr. President. Well, I think this is an uh, entirely legitimate topic uh, for debate. Name the time and place, Mr. President. Radical Russ has been prepping for this debate full-time since 2005. The Russ Belleville Show. 20 Roller Race. Oh, yeah. yeah. What's happening, Groovy Cats? This is your Funk Master of Ceremonies Big Daddy. And I want you to join me every Thursday night at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, right here at the Funky Roller Ring. Oh, yeah. yeah. Your home of soul, funk, and disco, baby. Funky It's always a party at the Funky Roller Ring. This is Radical Russ encouraging you to take a look at the Weed Blog every day. Johnny Green and the staff at the Weed Blog are on top of all the latest developments in the fight to end marijuana prohibition nationwide. You can even get the Weed Blog on your smartphone by installing the Weed Blog app for iPhone and Android. If it's about weed, it's on the Weed Blog, including my original writing. So don't delay. Read the Weed Blog today. It's time for the 420 Radio News, covering the latest headlines in consumer cannabis, medical marijuana, and industrial hemp. Transcripts of 420 Radio News are available daily on our website at 420radio.org. Now, here's Russ Belville with your marijuana headlines in 4 minutes and 20 seconds. This is your 420 Radio News for Monday, February 2nd, 2015. A pair of Kent County, Michigan correction officers charged with marijuana crimes will not be allowed to avoid prosecution by claiming they possess the marijuana under the guidelines of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. Todd Van Dorn and Michael Frederick have been charged with illegally possessing marijuana butter. The criminal charges have ended their careers and put their freedom in jeopardy. Van Dorn admitted in previous hearings that when narcotics officers came to his house, he had about a one pound of marijuana butter and a batch of marijuana butter brownies from from a 13-inch by 9-inch pan. Frederick testified he had more than four pounds at his house involving two full small tubs of butter, a partial tub, and a batch of brownies. Van Doren's attorney said the officers were doing their level best to follow what virtually everyone admits is a law that has been widely misused by both marijuana users and law enforcement. A push to allow Virginia doctors to legally prescribe marijuana to their patients for certain medical conditions has won the support of two state lawmakers on opposite sides of the political divide. Democratic Delegate Rich Anderson and Republican Senator George Barker. During a joint town hall meeting Saturday, both Barker and Anderson said they are inclined to support bills that would allow marijuana or the oils derived from the marijuana plant to be made available to patients who need it for conditions such as epilepsy, glaucoma, and cancer. While Anderson noted he could not support decriminalizing marijuana for recreational use, he said he's been contacted by, quote, a surprisingly large number, end quote, of Prince William families about the need for treatment derived from the marijuana plant. Barker said many of his colleagues are now thinking differently about marijuana's usefulness as a medical treatment. State Senator Daylon Leach, a Democrat of Montgomery County, reintroduced a bill Tuesday that would permit the use of marijuana for medical treatment in Pennsylvania. Leach and Republican State Senator Mike Fulmer held a press conference in the Capitol Rotunda Tuesday morning to announce Senate Bill 3, which is a largely unchanged version of a bill introduced last year. That bill passed the Senate 43-7 to with bipartisan support before dying in the House near the end of the legislative session. The bill would allow for the use of marijuana in treating seizure disorders in children as well as an array of other afflictions. Patients would need a referral from their physician to obtain a permit to purchase the narcotic. The cannabis products available would include extracted oils, edible products, ointments, and tinctures. The bill specifically bans the smoking of medical cannabis and also prescribes limits on the amount of cannabis in a person's system when they operate a vehicle or heavy machinery. 
Connecticut will move forward with a change in regulation to expand the medical marijuana program by adding three medical conditions to the original 11 that allow a person to buy and use marijuana in the state. The Consumer Protection Commissioner, Jonathan A. Harris, who oversees the program, announced Monday that he agrees with recommendations by the program's Board of Physicians and that he would draft regulations to add the three conditions the board approved, sickle cell disease, severe psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, post-laminectomy syndrome with chronic radiculopathy, or a recurring back pain after surgery. On January 14th, the Board of Physicians recommended expanding the qualifying conditions to include those three ailments, but both the Board and Harris declined to add Tourette's disorder to the list. One issue that has come up is support for the use of whole buds. Quote, the group Our Plant Our Right is an online petition seeking changes that would permit the sale of medical marijuana in its whole bud form. A longtime advocate for marijuana law reform in Massachusetts says legalization is coming to the Bay State by hook or by crook. Richard M. Evans, a Northampton lawyer and chairman of the Campaign to Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol in Massachusetts, a state wide referendum committee said, quote, we will push for legislation on Beacon Hill, but that won't stop us from also pursuing a ballot initiative in 2016, end quote. The Special Senate Committee on Marijuana, named by Senate President Stanley Rosenberg on January 22nd, will examine the state's rocky medical marijuana rollout, look at legalization experiences in Alaska, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington, and make recommendations regarding legislation. Governor Charlie Baker opposes legalizing marijuana, but more recently said he welcomes the investigation by the Senate. This has been your 420 Radio News for Monday, February 2nd, 2015. I'm Russ Belville. 420 Radio, the activist radio station. The Green Cross has been an amazing source of cannabis medicines for my pain management. Whether I need edibles or tinctures or topicals, I'm able to combine the two or three to give me really successful pain control. It's the delivery service that Green Cross provides is just incredible. You get your medicine and it's delivered by a person that you know you trust. Whether we come to you or you come to us, the Green Cross delivers. Cannabis Business Conference is coming to the Hyatt Regency Hotel in San Francisco, California, February 15th and 16th, 2015. Don't miss this exclusive opportunity to hear from the experts on the future of marijuana commerce, including scientists like Dr. Carl Hart, Dr. Amanda Ryman, and Dr. Stanton Peel, policy experts like Ethan Nadelman from Drug Policy Alliance, Anthony Johnson from Oregon's Legalization Campaign, travel author Rick Steves from Washington's Legalization Campaign, and California legalization pioneer Dale Sky Jones. Business experts like Harborside Steve D'Angelo, Arcview Group's Troy Dayton, and UFCW union leader Dan Rush. Cannabis journalists like Ricardo Baca, Steve Bloom, and Doug Fine, and California Republican Congressman Dana Rohrbacher, plus many, many more. Tickets are on sale now at internationalcbc.com, but hurry, last year's conference in Portland, Oregon was a sellout. International Cannabis Business Conference, San Francisco, California, February 15th and 16th, internationalcbc.com. Welcome back, everyone. 14 after the hour, and there is a new profile in the Boston Globe about Republican presidential hopeful Jeb Bush. Of course, Jeb Bush, another one of the Bush clan, a potential third President Bush, because America has been clamoring for such. Uh, He went to the prestigious boarding school Phillips Academy in Andover, Maryland, and the Boston Globe reports on his frequent pot smoking During his time as a high school class, uh, in his high school class, excuse me, saying, quote, I drank alcohol and I smoked marijuana when I was at Andover. It was pretty common, end quote. And the classmates of Jeb Bush noted that he smoked a notable amount of pot. 
So not just some casual dalliance, but a notable amount of pot. There's also some reports that he was selling as well, not just marijuana, but hashish. But of course, during Jeb Bush's political life, he has been adamantly opposed to marijuana and drug law reform. Uh, just this past summer, when Florida was attempting to pass a constitutional amendment to allow for medical marijuana use, Jeb Bush strongly urged Floridians to vote against the initiative. This is his quote back in August. Florida leaders and citizens have worked for years to make the Sunshine State a world-class location to start or run a business, a family-friendly destination for tourism, and a desirable place to raise a family or retire. Allowing large-scale marijuana operations to take root across Florida under the guise of using it for medicinal purposes runs counter to all these efforts, end quote. So that's Jeb Bush expressing how medical marijuana in Florida would be anti-tourism, anti-business, anti-family, and anti-elderly. Hmm. I wonder if he could explain that a little better uh, to my friend Kathy Jordan in Parrish, Florida, who has been alive for almost three decades now thanks to medical marijuana. Apparently, Kathy needs to continue to suffer and possibly be prosecuted for her marijuana use so that we won't scare people from going to Disney World or something like that. Of course, uh, Jeb Bush has been opposed to this for a long time. He was the governor of Florida previously, and during his time as Florida governor, he opposed uh, laws that were proposed that would give treatment instead of jail for nonviolent drug users. He also backed mandatory minimum sentences for drug possession offenses. But interestingly enough, Jeb Bush's daughter, Noelle Bush... Faced, faced drug rehabilitation and then charges for her sneaking uh, drugs, I believe it was cocaine, uh, crack cocaine, I believe, into the rehab. She was caught by the rehab for smoking or for uh, uh, smuggling crack into the rehab and uh, she got light treatment. She got a special treatment because she was the daughter of a Bush. And the hypocrisy of such a man who could have his own family difficulties with addiction and his own youthful indiscretions with buying, selling, and using marijuana and hash, that is a kind of hypocrisy that will increase your chance for cognitive dissonance by at least 6.7 Nancy Graces. And another person that noted this is another Republican presidential hopeful, Senator Rand Paul, the Republican from, from Kentucky, who told the Boston Globe, quote, this is a guy who now admits he smoked marijuana, but he wants to put people in jail who do. You would think he'd have a little more understanding then. Rand Paul uh, continued to say, quote, had he been caught at Andover, you know, where he went to school, he'd have never been governor and he'd probably never have a chance to run for the presidency, according to Rand Paul, who continued, quote, I think that's the real hypocrisy is that people on our side, which include a lot of people who made mistakes growing up, admit their mistakes, but now want to still put people in jail for that, end quote. Uh, you know, I, I have to agree with Senator Rand Paul on this issue, and this is starting to show how their, the marijuana issue could become a divisive issue within the presidential primaries among the Republicans, 13 of whom have thrown their hat into the ring so far, uh, indicating they wish to run for president. We could see a divide between those Republicans who are a little more forward thinking on the issue, a little more progressive, maybe not to the point of supporting legalization, but like Rand Paul, supporting decriminalization and supporting medical marijuana. It also augurs for a very interesting divide between the Republicans and the potential uh, nominee for the Democrats, the considered frontrunner Hillary Clinton, who herself is not that friendly on the marijuana issue, maybe even not that far away from Jeb Bush's uh, perspective on the issue. With that in play, it also shows how the marijuana issue in 2016 is going to be so critical for reformers to keep hammering home, to try to divide the Republican Party, to try to create that wedge and create that momentum and initiative to push the Democratic Party in response to be the party supporting the right of the people to determine their fate with respect to marijuana laws. 
It's the low hanging fruit of the 2016 election. It's the it's the uh, the issue that so many young voters are very attuned to. The first per- party to grab this could make great strides. Hide <gasps> the dope. We don't have any dope. And what did I just smoke? I've had those kind of days. <laughs> what was that we just smoked? Hey, folks, it's 420 in the mountain time zone. And sadly, the only 420 we get to celebrate today, there'll be no Toku Talk Radio Hour 2. I'll be on my way to Salem for a meeting of the Measure 91 Implementation Committee. Sorry, Bacon Dan, we'll catch you next week. So you're going to have to enjoy twice as much this 20 after break. We'll be back right after this. 420 Radio, the home of marijuana experts. Georgia. Hi, this is Willie Nelson. Alcohol prohibition didn't work in the 1920s, and marijuana prohibition isn't working today. It's time we stopped arresting responsible marijuana smokers. It's the fair thing to do. For more information, contact Normal, the national organization for the reform of marijuana laws. Call toll-free 888-67-NORML or visit their website at norml.org. Connect with 420radio.org through social media on Twitter at 420radioorg and our Facebook page at 420radioorg. Follow us and like us today. You'll be glad you did. Get dot buzz. Dot buzz is the internet platform that fuels community interest, excitement, and new experiences. Dot buzz is the premier online destination for internet users seeking the latest news on a variety of topics. Dot buzz appeals to groups active in blogging, communications, journalism, advertising, and marketing. Dot buzz offers registrants a stronger alternative to the shrinking namespace of existing top-level domain names such as dot com, dot net, and dot org. Get your name now at get dot buzz. Arguing for the end of adult marijuana prohibition is easy because we have facts, science, reason, compassion, evidence, truth, and logic on our side. It is even easier when researchers catalog it all for us. Learn how to gather the facts on marijuana use, arrests, seizures, rehabs, drug tests, and more in this edition of Drug War Data Mining. Welcome back, everyone. 22 and a half after the hour. And my mentor, Keith Strop, the founder of Normal, has a great piece over on Marijuana.com's news blog today about how officials in the newly legal states of Oregon and Alaska are ignoring the votes of the people and tinkering with those marijuana laws to their liking before they've even become implemented by their legislatures. Now, we'll take a look at Alaska at another time. Today, I'm going to look at my home state of Oregon, where Noel Crumbie writes for The Oregonian that John Kitzhaber, our governor, weighs in on regulating marijuana. This was a hearing that took place on Friday, and the governor uh, wrote a letter to the Oregon Liquor Control Commission. They're charged with implementing the regulations and writing the, the rules for Measure 91. Uh, Earlier this week, or actually uh, last week, uh, Governor Kitzhaber said that the recreational marijuana possession limits were too high. That's the eight ounces that were allowed to possess per household, not per person, but per household at home where we're growing four marijuana plants. He has continued by uh, writing in this letter to the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, uh, and I'll just read you some of the, the relevant parts here. I believe it is critical for the regulatory framework to protect children, promote safety and health in communities, and prevent the diversion of marijuana outside of the well-regulated Oregon market. Once again, we've got to lead with what about the children, as if the people writing Measure 91 didn't think about that. He says, in implementing Measure 91, the robust regulatory framework must control access to marijuana beyond solely prohibiting retail sales to minors. Oregon must also prohibit marijuana products and marketing that appeal to minors. Again, this idea of prohibiting certain products because they might appeal to minors ignores the fact that a lot of adults like those products too. Hell, I'm eating gummy bears right now, Governor. Lots of us like gummy bears. The onus on protecting the children from gummy bears or cookies or any of these medicated products falls upon the parents 
exercising their responsibility as parents. There are all sorts of tasty things kids might get into if parents left them leave uh, all out on the coffee table. This calls for education and proper packaging and labeling of products, not for bans, Governor Kitzhaber. Furthermore, he continues by saying that uh, we ought to give the OLCC broad authority to establish criteria and conditions for the appropriate licensing and citing of producers, processors, and retail outlets. Uh, this sounds to me a lot like zoning us out into the red light districts uh, and keeping us a mile away from the possible view of children's eyes, even though we don't hold alcohol establishments, strip clubs, liquor stores, bar, don't hold, hold any of them to that standard. We also have the governor asking for the tools for law enforcement to help keep our roads safe and pre prevent DUIDs. This again sounds a lot like coming up with an unscientific per se DUID limit, which we strongly reject as being unscientific and unjust. He also says that the regulatory framework should drive producers, processors, and consumers alike into the regulated market. This is impossible without tracking all marijuana from seed to sale regardless of whether it's produced or consumed for recreational or medicinal purposes. Once again, intimating that we ought to merge medical and recreational, essentially ending the medical program, despite the fact that Measure 91, voted on by 56% of the people, three times explicitly said that the medical marijuana law was not to be changed. He also continues by saying, we should also take a look at the provisions at, for homegrown marijuana to determine whether adjustments can be made to minimize opportunities for black market production. Governor, the reason we decided on eight ounces possession at home was exactly that reason, to have enough marijuana that someone processing their four plants would not end up as a felon for possessing too much marijuana. That is what's going to lead to black market diversion. If someone harvests their eight ounces but can only keep an ounce of it, where where do you think that other seven ounces is going to go? I'll tell you what, folks, we're not going to be throwing it in the garbage. We're not going to be flushing it down the toilet. And Governor Kitzhaber really ought to take a look at how much support he actually has. Way back in 1997, when he was governor, uh, the Oregon legislature recriminalized marijuana. We'd had it decrimmed since 1973, and after 25 years, 24 years, the legislature recriminalized the nasty weed. In 1998, the people came back with a referendum, and by a vote of 66.5%, a two to one margin, they overturned the legislature's tinkering and the governor's signature on the recriminalization of marijuana. Medical marijuana got 54% in this state in three out of four elections governor kitzhaber has barely approached 50 percent of the people's support and in the most recent election measure 91 got 56.1 percent of the vote it got the highest support for marijuana legalization of any marijuana legalization passed in the four states the most support and Measure 91 ended up with 115,778 more votes than Governor Kitzhaber did, who in fact did not even achieve a majority support in the vote. More people voted against Governor Kitzhaber than voted for him. Governor, it's time for you to respect the will of the people and understand the intelligent folks that wrote Measure 91 did so with an eye toward the lessons learned in Washington and Colorado. Let's implement the law as written and then figure out what we need to fix about it. 420 Radio fighting prohibition since 2012. Growing plants indoors can be a rewarding hobby, but electricity bills can go through the roof. Then you have to cool down all those big hot lights. It can drive a grower insane. With Lush LED lighting, you can solve many of these issues and double your rewards. Matt and his scientists have developed the perfect light for flowering plants with far less cost and heat. And the results, very effective. Check out LushLEDLighting.com right now and tell them Radical Russ sent you. Normal stands for responsible adult cannabis use. If cannabis use is causing problems in your life, consider taking a break or seeking medical assistance. Consider ceasing cannabis use if you have a family history of mental illness. Don't drive or operate heavy machinery while impaired by cannabis use. Cannabis use is not without risks, even though the risks are far less than those posed by legal drugs. 
The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, treat law enforcement with respect and stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all of my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent and I want to speak with my attorney. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at omarfigueroa.com. It's time for the Russ Belleville Show's Cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Dr. Earlywine is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany and a leading author and researcher on cannabinoids and health who pins the Ask Dr. Mitch column for High Times Magazine. Get your questions ready in our live chat or call in to 971-533-7111 now. Welcome back, everyone. Half past the hour. And joining us again for our weekly dose of medicine, we've got Dr. Mitch Earlywine. How you doing, Dr. Mitch? Oh, well, got to hit the mute button. Let's try that again. How are you, Dr. Mitch? Eight inches of snow, man. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Still snowed in there in northern New York, I can imagine. So uh, got the got the fire going, got the uh, the booty socks on, everything okay? Oh, yeah, we're making the mess of it. All right. Uh, we've got lots of questions and studies and science to get to. Before that, let's just remind everyone you can call in live with your questions at 971-533-7111, or you can send your questions in through our chat room. Just go to 420radio.org and click on the green chat button. We'll take our questions there if you have something to ask. But let's start off by giving Dr. Mitch the first word in cannabis science. What's the uh, latest that you've got for us? Well, the most pressing issue, I need to emphasize that Pete Carroll and I were at USC together and I never saw him smoke any pot. <laughs> so we can't blame legal marijuana uh, ingestion on Pete Carroll's decision to leave the best running back in football <laughs> without touching the ball on the half yard line to win the Super Bowl. It wasn't pot to blame. If, if he had made it, it would have been brilliant, but now he's paying the price. What can I say? <laughs> There's an upside to legal weed and a downside to legal weed, I suppose. All right. Well, um, poor Seahawks fans out there, you know, at least you've got legal weed and some of the best sativa grown on the planet to uh, get you through this off season. I know it hurts. Believe me, I suffered the same pain two weeks ago. All right. Let's get to some questions. I got some email questions for you, Dr. Mitch. And our first one here uh, comes from Andrew in Sacramento who wants to know about dabbing and whether or not when you dab, is that vaporizing weed or is it combusting weed? Are we getting vapor or are we getting smoke? As it turns out, it's a pretty fine distinction, but it's probably closer to combustion. It's probably closer to smoke. There tends to be a, an opportunity at least for a little more of the respiratory irritants to be in there. But we haven't done the kind of studies we've done with smoke versus vaporizers, so it's unclear exactly what the respiratory impact is going to be long term. Hmm. You know, I was as I thought. You know, he emailed this question to me, and I gave an answer. I was like, "Well, I mean, doesn't the difference between vaporization and combustion come down to the temperature that it's heated to?" It, it very much the case, and the key with the vaporizer is that uh, certain. Uh, respiratory irritants aren't released because the plant really never catches fire with concentrated super super high heat but what's in there is actually mostly just uh, cannabinoids so it's it's kind of a curious trade-off and we'll just have to wait and see uh, when the the right pyrotechnic folks can get a hold of it and, and do the studies that need to be done yeah I'm sure they will so basically that would be pointing out that since concentrates don't have a whole lot of plant matter in them there's not much plant matter to burn, even if you are burning it. That, that should be the case. So we'll, we'll just have to see how it turns out. All right. Very interesting. Uh, we got another question by email from Mark in St. Louis who says, uh, I've heard that stomach acid can destroy cannabinoids delivered orally. I have an acid reflux issue and edibles don't seem to hit me like others. Could the high acid content in his stomach be the reason for this? Nobody's ever shown that uh, decreases cannabinoid total content, but it definitely leads to erratic absorption. So it's distinctly possible that this might, might be why. And uh, the irony is is some uh, cannabis-mediated links to ulcer and some of the high uh, acid reflux issues may respond to the cannabis. So I, I really understand the quandary, and he uh, might want to turn to a vaporizer instead. 
All right. Uh, now let's get to some of the science that came out over the past week. Uh, there's a study, uh, the Phoenix New Times blog reported on this, that daily marijuana use doesn't really change the brains of adults or teens. Uh, this is something we found, you know, with checking out the, the responses of people. But this is one looking at the actual brains. Uh, what can you tell us about this study? I was delighted to see that this published because it's not easy to publish a study that says, hey, there's nothing going on here. But they looked at both adults and in adolescents. These were heavy users. The sample size was big enough. If something had been there, they should have found it. And I think uh, what's curious is that as soon as I posted it, everybody was saying, well, I'll believe it when it replicates. But they never, of course, say that when we do find differences. I think now that uh, they're not letting them just, you know, rapid fire, just grab any spot that might be different. When you actually have to hypothesize ahead of time, we're going to see these effects are either super small, only in super heavy users who started really early in life, or in fact not there at all. I was delighted that the Phoenix News at least covered this somewhat. You notice CNN did not hit this. This isn't in The Guardian. This isn't in the places where we usually see the alarmist marijuana is going to kill you headlines and so i was a little disappointed with the media about their coverage yeah all right we've got a call coming in from the 865 area code you're on the air what's your question for dr mitch um my question is is there any new research done as far as vaporization and severe depression and depressive dementia well, what we've got is uh, some correlational stuff on depression, but uh, the cannabinoids are never my first choice for uh, depression treatment. A uh, nice 12-session treatment with a trained therapist is usually better, or check out David Burns' book, Feeling Good. And then with the uh, Alzheimer's and other dementia, we've got some compelling stuff uh, you know, at, in the Petri dish and even now in, at the rodent level. It seems like it ought to be uh, preventative of those amyloid plaques that seem to be the source of Alzheimer's, but we just don't have the human data to really say it's, it's going to happen yet. But that's, you know, that's the kind of thing where the risk would probably not be too high. Thank you. All right. Thanks for your question, 865. Appreciate you called in. Our phone lines are open at 971-533-7111. There's another study that we wanted to ask you about, Dr. Mitch. This one uh, was reported by Denver's 9 News that pot has similar carcinogens to tobacco. Oh, my God, Dr. Mitch, it's time for pot and cancer wards. <laughs> I mean, it's so funny because... I mean, we've known this for decades. Yes, they do have some key components that are the same, but there's one critical difference. There's nicotine in tobacco. There's THC in marijuana. THC makes it so if you do have a lung cell go rogue and become cancerous, you will basically uh, get it to kill itself and get sloughed off. Nicotine, unfortunately, uh, increases the probability of that same cell turning into a big tumor. The rest of it is, is, you know, maybe the source of some uh, tightness in the chest or a little bit of wheezing, but it's not going to create lung cancer. Donald Tashkin's been following people around in Los Angeles for literally 30 years now. We're just not getting those marijuana-only cases. Uh, obviously, anybody who's smoking cigarettes is uh, taking the risk in their hands. But cannabis alone does not seem to be a source of this. That's right, folks. I always like to say that, uh, you know, chemistry matters. Uh, water contains hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen's highly explosive, but water is not flammable. Okay, so you can't just say something has carcinogens and expect people to think that that therefore makes it carcinogen is carcinogenic. There's a whole lot more at play. And like Dr. Mitch mentions, THC is the big thing at play in cannabis smoke. Of course, if you're worried about the smoke, folks, switch to vaporization. It's always better for you. All right. We've got another story here. I ran it on this a little bit last week, but this uh, uh, data coming out from the Colorado State Patrol showing that, as the Denver Post puts it, marijuana was involved in 12 percent of the DUI cases. Uh, what are your comments on this? I mean, that statistic by itself, unfortunately, doesn't mean anything. They're looking for it more. There are more cops who are trained to try to find folks who are impaired by cannabis. We have no idea what the percentage was even a year ago. So I'm sorry that they're 12%, and I encourage people to never drive high, but 
I'm not sure what to say uh, as far as an impact of legalization or even just the natural variation and how much this goes year to year. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, and to me, you know, marijuana being cited in 12 percent of their DUIs is kind of interesting that 12 percent of people aged 18 and older in Colorado use marijuana monthly. So, so that's what, pretty much exactly what we'd expect. What a, what, a, what, a, what a surprise. We found the exact same distribution. All right. Uh, the chat room is reacting to some of this uh, nicotine and cancer information, asking, is it really the nicotine in cigarettes that causes cancer? Or is it some of the other 400 toxic substances in the uh, smoke? So nicotine alone may not start the cancerous cell, but it does prevent it from uh, basically killing itself and getting sloughed off. So it does encourage the tumor formation, even uh, though a lot of stuff suggests that maybe nicotine by itself is not a carcinogen. Okay. And uh, is there, are the carcinogens themselves generated because of the heat and combustion? Um, only, only in the sense that uh, they're creating these dark burned things, basically burnt stuff, carbon like that is, is, is often the source of this. So it's, it's because this has been lit on fire Heat may uh, increase your susceptibility to it turning into a tumor, but it, heat alone is usually not a carcinogen. All right. We're speaking with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Our phone lines are open at 971-533-7111. And we want to remind you that if you don't get your question on the air, you can always send it in by email to 420research at gmail.com. Dr. Mitch gets that directly, and you can keep it private if you so wish. Uh, our final question uh, for Dr. Mitch, uh, I'm looking at uh, our governor. I just uh, spoke about our governor, Kitzhaber, who uh, seems to be uh, wanting to change the marijuana law here in Oregon before it's even been implemented. We're hearing similar things in Alaska, and Keith Strop wrote a great article about this. What would you like to tell these elected officials about their plans to implement marijuana laws in Oregon and Alaska? Uh, bottom line is, when you were sworn in, you swore to uphold your state constitution, and that means following the law the way it was written. <laughs> I'm sorry if it's not the way you like it. Go ahead and put one up for a ballot measure yourself if you want a different one. That's really all I can say. All right. And uh, just an update real quick, if you have any information for us on the progress of marijuana reform in the New York Assembly. I know, I, I believe that they're trying to reintroduce some uh, measures to modify medical marijuana and perhaps even move forward with legalization. What can you tell us? I went down there, put a tie on and everything, and spoke as effusively as I could. It's going to be in the finance committee, and they're going to try to estimate all the pros and cons and turn them into dollars, which has always driven me completely crazy because freedom doesn't actually have a price tag. Yeah, really, it should be legal, even if it ends up costing us money. We shouldn't determine people's civil rights on a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, Dr. Mitch, thanks for joining us here on our Cannabis Q&A, and we'll talk to you next week. Looking forward to it. All right. And uh, stay warm there. Hope you don't get snowed in too badly in New York State. Looking pretty snowy out there. And uh, back here in Portland, uh, you know, it's uh, 45 and rainy, just like it is for the past two months. And it will be for the next two months. Groundhog Day doesn't really mean a whole lot to us here in Portland. There's so many clouds, there's no way a groundhog could possibly see its shadow. <laughs> Hey, we're coming back with the Radical Rant right after the anti-drug public service announcement of the day. We're going to talk about deputizing citizens to fight and die in their drug war. It's got to stop now. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show. The voice of the marijuana nation. 420 Radio, your ticket to the Boston Freedom Rally. Are you in the market for portable vaporizers now? Get online to vapes.buzz, the quick and easy link to portablevaporizersnow.com. Vapes.buzz has everything you're looking for, including vape pens, herbal vaporizers, e-juice, parts, accessories, and more. Visit vapes.buzz and save 5% instantly or give them a call at 866-264-2415. Vapes.buzz. Get vaping, baby. In 
the interest of fair and balanced journalism, the Russ Belleville Show presents the anti-drug public service announcement of the day. New research shows a permanent drop in IQ when marijuana is used regularly before the age of 18. Marijuana, it lowers intelligence. This has been the anti-drug public service announcement of the day. To cure this sort of reefer madness, listen to the Russ Belville Show every weekday on 420radio.org. Adam Hand of Handmade Apparel produces quality custom designs for t-shirts, hats, and other apparel. Handmade Apparel is the official design shop for 420 Radio, among many clients who rely on Adam Hand for everything from short-run custom projects to full-run clothing lines. Visit handmadeapparel.biz to browse the selection of handmade gear or to get a personal quote for your own designs. Handmade Apparel, a proud supporter of 420radio.org. must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one. I support a change in law to end federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. That marijuana, pot, grass, whatever you want to call it, is probably the most dangerous drug. Some think there won't be room for them in jail. We'll make room. I experimented with marijuana a time or two, and I didn't like it, and didn't inhale. And one major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. Entirely legitimate topic uh, for debate. Radical Rant. Welcome back, everyone. 46 after the hour, and today for the rant, we turn to Jacob Sullum, who is writer for Reason.com, uh, and his piece busted over $80 worth of pot. College student turns informant, then turns up dead. Last week, North Dakota's Bureau of Criminal Investigation, or BCI, released a report that finds no wrongdoing in the way an anti-drug task force handled a young confidential informant who turned up dead last June. Andrew Sadek, a 20-year-old student at North Dakota State College of Science in Wapaton, agreed to work as an informant for the Southeast Multi-County Agency Drug Task Force, or SEMCA, after he was arrested for selling pot on campus in 2013. His death calls to mind similar cases in which young drug offenders facing draconian penalties were forced into dangerous undercover work, including Rachel Hoffman, a Florida college student who was murdered in 2008 after agreeing to arrange the purchase of ecstasy, cocaine, and a gun for $10,000. Sadek himself was entrapped by a CI who bought marijuana from him on two occasions. Although the total value of the sales was just $80, Sadek faced up to 20 years in prison because the sales occurred in a school zone. He agreed to do to others what had been done to him, buying marijuana at Semka's direction from two dealers at his school on three occasions from November 2013 to January 2014. Each time, Sadek bought an eighth of an ounce for $60. According to the BCI report, he had to buy from two more dealers, quote, to fulfill his obligation in resolving the charges he had been facing, end quote. But at that point, Sadek stopped communicating with his handler at Semka, which therefore charged him with two felonies and a misdemeanor on May 9th. That was a week after Sadek was reported missing. On June 27th, his body was found in the Red River near Breckenridge, Minnesota, with a gunshot wound to the head. His mother, Tammy Sadek, requested the investigation that led to the BCI report, which was the work of a review board appointed by Attorney General Wayne Stenjum. Stenichem. Quote, Semka conducts themselves appropriately, Wapaton Police Chief Scott Thorsteinson said, told the Grand Forks Herald after the report was released. I was gratified to see an independent review indicate exactly that. End quote. Thorsteinson conceded that police informants work in a, quote, dangerous subculture, end quote, but said cops usually, quote, bend over backwards to protect their CI, end quote. In an interview with KVLY, the NBC station in Fargo, Thorstenson said Sadek's death is no cause for reflection on the methods used by drug warriors in North Dakota. Quote, These types of investigations are conducted the same way pretty much everywhere where people breathe in and out. They never did anything wrong that needed to be changed. End quote. 
Forrest and Son, who acknowledged that Sadek's mother, quote, had to go through a difficult ordeal, end quote, explained that busting drug offenders is a thankless but necessary job. Quote, law enforcement were generally not popular. The sheepdog is not loved by the flock and they're hated by the wolf, but we do it anyway, end quote. In Thorstenson's view, the citizens he serves are sheep, while harmless pot dealers like Sadek are wolves. Quote, he was murdered, Tammy Sadek told KFGO, a radio station in Fargo, and this report actually reinforces that in our minds. We know that, and we know they're not even looking at anything. Did somebody he was trying to get for them do it? Or somebody he already got? However Andrew died, Sadek warned, others are at risk. Quote, Semka is alive and well on campus, she warned. They're still using kids. They're not protecting these kids. End quote. That's Jacob Sullum's piece at uh, Reason.com, and uh, we'll post that link in our chat room if you'd like to uh, leave your comments and thanks to Jacob for reporting on this. This strikes a chord with me, folks, because one of the first stories I ever covered uh, as I began my marijuana reporting career in 2008 was that murder of Rachel Hoffman in Florida where the, uh, was it Tallahassee police, Tampa police? I can't remember if it was Tallahassee or Tampa, but anyway, the police had set her up as a confidential informant after busting her for selling weed and ecstasy at school. She was uh, quickly discovered to be wearing a wire by the two drug, the two violent, known violent drug dealers she was set up to sting. And uh, they took her out to a country road and shot her execution style, point blank just as this young man was shot. So in the six years that I've been reporting on this, no change. We still have small town cops staking out their colleges, trying to entrap young people that are merely buying and selling personal amounts of marijuana People who are of the legal age to vote, people who are of the legal age to go fight and die in one of America's wars. But the cops need to set up these stings to bust these kids. And then they use these busted kids to set up other stings to bust other kids. Now, does any of this prevent the usage of marijuana on these college campuses? For decades now, we have seen the rate of marijuana use on college campuses to remain fairly high. We have seen, in most states, the rate of marijuana use stay steady or increase. And in the state of North Dakota, where this action happened, we find that the rate of use by people aged 18 and older went up by 2.37% from the 2010-2011 biennium to the 2012-2013 biennium. So it appears that these tactics are not having the intended effect. It appears that these kids are continuing to use marijuana the latest survey, National Survey on Drug Use and Health, shows that in the state of North Dakota, 14% of people aged 18 to 25, that's your college-age people, are using marijuana on a monthly basis. That's one out of seven North Dakota college kids who are using marijuana. Chief Thorstenson, your efforts are not working and they're destroying lives. They are getting people killed. And it says something about a crime when the only way you can pursue that crime is through committing crime. Is by forcing people to break the law to entrap other people to break the law. Now, we don't seem to have that problem with assaults and murders and rapes and robberies. In those actual crimes, there is plenty of support among the people 
and plenty of complaints and reports by the victims to justify the police going after these real criminals. But we are finding in poll after poll that super majorities in this country, even in North Dakota, support the idea that nobody should go to jail for a marijuana conviction, that nobody using a personal amount of marijuana should be subject to a cage. Yet the police, they know this is a jobs program. They understand that any move toward progress on marijuana reform means less money coming in to their coffers. It takes away the probable cause they can manufacture by claiming to smell marijuana or causing a dog to alert. They know that ending marijuana criminalization takes away tools from their tool belt to get around the fourth and fifth amendment of the people they're trying fourth and fifth amendment rights of the people that they're trying to bust. We know that it ends up costing them in seizures, costing them in arrest statistics and costing them in asset forfeitures. North Dakota has tried decriminalization bills in the past. They've never gotten anywhere. The current law in North Dakota maintains the criminal status of marijuana, maintains misdemeanor penalties for people who break that law with a possibility, and this is for just a half ounce, folks, for a half ounce of marijuana, misdemeanor penalty, 30 days in jail, $1,000 fine. If you're a college student, that misdemeanor penalty means you lose your financial aid. So we're talking about busting kids on this college campus and not only risking their lives by making them confidential informants, but even if everything turns out well for them, losing their college scholarships, losing their financial aid, possession of an ounce to a, to a, a half ounce to an ounce, misdemeanor with a year in prison and a thousand dollar fine, sale of marijuana, any amount. Felony, 10 years, $10,000 fine. So, this young man, this 20-year-old man, died while committing felonies for the police because he was caught committing a felony by another kid who was committing felonies for the police. This abomination must end. Our kids should not be pawns in the drug war. Going undercover, especially dealing with drug dealers who tend to be armed and have the mantra that snitches get stitches, Undercover operations should only be pursued by undercover cops, cops with the training and wherewithal to handle themselves in these situations, to recognize danger when it approaches. These cops that continue to use these confidential informants, that continue to use college kids to bust other college kids, are no better than cowards for not setting up the stings and doing it themselves. Haven't they seen 21 Jump Street? Get some of them Johnny Depp 21 Jump Street cops. Stop drafting our kids to do your dirty work for you. This is no place for any college student to be forced to do the work of the cops. <laughs>